Latin America has long been considered, at least by the Americans, as their backyard, part of their sphere of influence. What happens in South America is the business of the United States. It's one of America's oldest foreign policy doctrines, called the Monroe Doctrine. However, as the Cold War began to settle in, things seemed like they might be in a rough position, and the United States needed to act to ensure the loyalty of Latin America. I'm your host David, and today we'll be taking a quick tour of what the situation in Latin America looked like in the early Cold War period. This is The Cold War. Latin America was a land of incredibly stark inequality. This meant that while a few families and individuals sat on vast fortunes, many who lived in Central and South America struggled for the necessities of life. This level of inequality can breed dissent, and is a ripe target for a socialist movement. However, the governments who fostered said inequality were good friends of the United States. The US had solidified alliances with every Latin American country, save Uruguay, who preferred neutrality, and Argentina, which did not get involved but had warm feelings for Germany during the Second World War. Many Latin American countries provided support during the war, such as Mexico's legendary fighter squadron, the Aztec Eagles, or the support of Brazil protecting the Atlantic, and even participating in the campaign for Italy. After the war, the US had other arenas of the Cold War to focus on in places like Europe, Korea, and Vietnam. So Latin America was a lower priority. They did, however, feel their influence could use some work. They were disturbed that during the war Axis forces made overtures to Latin American countries, and in some countries, such as Argentina, were somewhat receptive. So as in other regions, the US established regional defense-oriented organizations to counter the influence of communism. The most famous you might recognize is NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which will definitely feature heavily on this channel. The seeds of a Latin American pact began in response to those Axis overtures in the 30s. During the regular meetings of the International Conferences of American States, they worked to create a defensive body of these states and made a strong effort to keep them from leaving America's sphere of influence. In 1945, many of the same countries attended the Inter-American Conference on Problems of War and Peace, or the Chapultepec Conference. It mostly focused on working through development and aid, and the role of previous Pan-American goals with the new United Nations project. Here they worked out a system of regional security pacts, which then passed in the UN. The gang got together again after the war in the Brazilian city of Rio de Janeiro, to discuss what this hemispheric defense pact might look like. America's number one goal in this 1947 conference was to counter the growth of Soviet influence. The idea would be to make whatever pact that came out of said conference a pact that was explicitly anti-communist. In case you had any doubts, they got what they wanted, and the group signed the Inter-American Treaty of Reciprocal Assistance, or simply the Rio Treaty. This treaty would make the US feel like they had the Latin American situation contained for now. They would use it as needed throughout the Cold War, including during the Cuban Missile Crisis. To facilitate more collaboration and cooperation between states in the Western Hemisphere, 21 American countries signed the charter of a new Organization of American States in Bogota in 1948. The idea behind the OAS was similar to many in the United Nations. They wanted to foster development, maintain regional peace, and promote representative democracy, something that the US would definitely not be interested in honoring. And no discussion of Latin America would be apt without heavily setting up the darker chapters to come. The United States, at the same time it was setting up these organizations of mutual defense and cooperation, was spearheading an intervention to prevent a communist takeover of Greece. The thing, though, is that the side the US backed was a monarchy. From the first American interventions in the Cold War, it became apparent that being anti-communist was more important to US interests than fostering a democratically elected government. The first chapter in the many, many incidents this thinking would play out in Latin America happened in Guatemala in 1954. Since the Spanish-American War, the dictatorship governments of Guatemala were more than happy to go along with US economic interests in return for American support. 
One of those financial interests was the UFC, the Ultimate Fighting Chip. No, the United Fruit Company, which received significant land concessions and control over vast amounts of Guatemalan infrastructure. UFC eventually had a complete monopoly over Guatemalan banana exports. This is why you might find countries like these referred to as banana republics. The US even sent the military into Guatemala to make sure no new elected president dare violate the interests of the fruit company. Definitely two mismatched fighters in that octagon. This changed when popular sentiment against the dictator, Jorge Ubico, began to really sour in 1944, forcing him to leave in the wake of a student-led revolution. The revolution turned Guatemala into a democracy and elected their first president, Juan José Arevalo. He was a conservative, but still many liberal reforms happened in Guatemala under his rule, such as the introduction of a minimum wage. He also managed to do multiple things to suppress communist influence, such as banning most unions and cracking down on the Labour Party. Nonetheless, the US suspected Arevalo of having Soviet influence because he backed a group called the Caribbean League, which had the goal of toppling US-backed dictators around the region. In 1950, Guatemala had an election, and Jacopo Arbenz became the new president of Guatemala, a liberal moderate, but one slightly more in favor of change than his predecessor. He wanted to improve the lives of the poor workers and peasants in Guatemala. He also undertook one of the most dangerous things you can do during the Cold War, land reform. The idea was to take uncultivated land away from wealthy landowners and give them to poor farmers to have their own land to live on. It would reform the near feudal system in Guatemala, and it led to a quick increase in agricultural output, and the economy actually began to do better. But then there's the whole United Fruit Company situation. They were fabulously wealthy, owned tons of land in Guatemala, and controlled the only major Atlantic port the country had. These lands and labor reforms threatened to affect the United Fruit Company's bottom line. In the context of the Cold War, it didn't take much convincing for the US to be convinced that this was the encroachment of communism. So the CIA set its sights on Guatemala and enacted Operation PB Fortune. The plan was to enact a coup as well as assassinate dozens of people deemed communists. In late 1952, a United Fruit Company ship came into port loaded with weapons disguised as farming equipment. However, the plan was abruptly cancelled for reasons not certain to this day. But the story wasn't over. The new CIA director, Alan Dulles, a part of the Eisenhower administration, had ties to the United Fruit Company. Also, in 1953, the CIA had successfully overthrown the democratically elected leader of Iran to install a pro-American dictator. So they knew that this could work now. They enacted a new plan, Operation PD Success. The plan got approval from Eisenhower and trained a group of mercenaries in Nicaragua and Honduras to overthrow the Guatemalan government. A group of 480 men and US air support invaded Guatemala in June 1954. Outnumbered, the army also used psychological warfare to convince them that the 480 men led by Castillo Armas had already taken over the country and that President Arbenz needed to resign. The officer corps of the Guatemalan military eventually turned on Arbenz. He was forced to resign and receive political asylum in Mexico. Castillo Armas became the leader of a military junta in Guatemala. There was another CIA project after the coup to retroactively try and find justification for it called Operation PB History. They were looking for a connection to the USSR, but none ever came up. The operation itself received almost universal condemnation from America's enemies and allies. The USSR got a PR victory by pointing out the US had helped overthrow a democratically elected government at the bidding of a fruit company. The successes in Guatemala and Iran would make the CIA confident in its abilities to intervene on behalf of American interests abroad. Future revolutionaries like Fidel Castro would learn from this tactic and make sure that when the CIA came for them, they wouldn't make the same mistakes. The coup will also exile a young Che Guevara, who would become one of the most notorious Marxist rebels of the 20th century. If you don't know who Che Guevara is, you've likely seen him on a t-shirt somewhere. 
I did say this was the first chapter, didn't I? Stories like this would take on a grim familiarity in Latin America throughout the Cold War. Guatemala would not be the first elected government to experience a right-wing coup backed by the CIA. The story from here only gets more depressing and darker, so let's just put a cork in this particular bottle for the time being. We hope you enjoyed today's topic, and to make sure you don't miss future episodes, please make sure you subscribe to our channel and have pressed the bell button. We can be reached via email at thecoldwarchannel at gmail.com or on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash thecoldwartv. We rely on our patrons to create these videos, so consider supporting us via www.patreon.com slash thecoldwar. This is The Cold War Channel, and we will catch you on the next one.